On May 5th, 1994, a bulldozer operator was digging a hole to build a swimming pool in the backyard of a family's dream home in San Marino, California, a wealthy suburb about 12 miles from Los Angeles, when he felt the blade hit something hard. It was a fiberglass box with plastic bags that had something wrapped inside them. When he leaned down for a closer look, he saw a human skull. Soon, the home at 1920 Lorraine Road became a crime scene, and it wasn't long before all the neighbors started gossiping. Could this, they wondered, be related to the young couple who went missing from that address nine years earlier under mysterious circumstances? And whatever happened to the strange guy who lived in the guest house? Fourteen years later, he finally reappeared. That's when the FBI arrested Clark Rockefeller, the 47-year-old heir to the oil and banking dynasty, for kidnapping his seven-year-old daughter, Ray. A case that involved a billionaire banker, a messy divorce, and a dramatic custodial kidnapping in a getaway car would have been the talk of the town under normal circumstances. And this one was about to get a lot crazier. Police issued an Amber Alert that read like a Ralph Lauren ad, telling the world to be on the lookout for a suspect wearing Lacoste shirt and khaki pants. Police found Clark after a week-long manhunt. He was hiding in Baltimore and using the alias Chip Smith. After returning Ray safely to her mother, detectives started digging into Clark's past and realized that Chip Smith was only the latest in a long list of aliases. In San Marino, California, he was known as Christopher Chichester, British aristocrat. In Greenwich, Connecticut, he was Christopher Crow, Hollywood producer. On Wall Street, he was Clark Rockefeller, bond broker and trust fund playboy, art dealer, international debt negotiator, surgeon, ship captain. Who was Clark Rockefeller? Police in California had another potential label for him, cold-blooded killer. They wanted to talk to him about the guest house that he used to rent and the headless body they dug up from the backyard. I'm Katherine Townsend, and this is Red Collar. Who is Clark Rockefeller? Detectives were finding out fast that this might be a multiple choice answer. His whole life appeared to be a lie, and the clean cut, preppy facade merely a mask hiding a psychopathic personality. Why'd you go by? You said your name is uh, James Clark Rockefeller? Well, that's the name, you know, it doesn't exist, so there's no such person, really. So, what's your real name? Well, that, that is it. That's the name that I'm using, so, you know, I mean, that is my real name. You born James Clark Rockefeller? Probably not. Clark told investigators that a lot of his life, including his entire childhood, had been a blur. Finally, detectives were able to lift a fingerprint from a wine glass he drank from, and they matched it to the immigration application of Christian Carl Gerhard Strider. Clark wasn't born on Manhattan's Upper East Side. He wasn't the scion of an American banking dynasty. He wasn't even American. Clark was a German national who came to the U.S. in 1978 and never left. Daniel F. Conley, the Suffolk County District Attorney in Boston, said that the man masquerading as Clark Rockefeller had perpetrated, quote, the longest con I've seen in my professional career, end quote. So who is Clark Rockefeller? We may never know the whole story. We do know that he was born in West Berlin in 1961 and grew up in Bergen, Germany, a small town in the Bavarian Alps. Bavaria is kind of like the Arkansas of Germany. It's the home of cute and folksy traditions like Oompa Bands and Beersteins, but also has a less pleasant far-right history. Its capital, Munich, was where the Nazi party was founded. But from the time he was a child, friends and family say that the young Christian was obsessed with fantasy, and with getting out of Germany and into a bigger life. When he was 17, a chance meeting with a California couple would change the course of his life forever. Elmer and Jean Kelm saw Clark hitchhiking in the rain while they were traveling through Germany. They gave him a lift, and he invited them to dinner, where they told him all about their hometown of Loma Linda, California. Soon after that, Christian flew to the U.S. and made his way to Berlin, Connecticut. According to writer Mark Seal, who wrote several articles in Vanity Fair about the case, as well as the book The Man in the Rockefeller Suit, Christian had already graduated from high school in Germany, but he claimed to be an exchange student anyway. He enrolled in a local high school and planned to spend his senior year with a local family, the Savios. According to the Savio family, he acted as if household chores were beneath him and told his friends that his parents were wealthy industrialists. He seemed to spend most of his time sitting on the couch and watching Gilligan's Island. He was especially fascinated with the character Thurston Howell III and even started mimicking Thurston's mannerisms and his over-the-top East Coast elite accent. Even at an early age, Clark seemed to be exhibiting something red-collar experts call chameleon syndrome. He tried to adapt his environment, but his grandiosity and impulsiveness got in the way. Eventually, the Savios got sick of him and asked him to leave. So Christian headed to the University of Wisconsin and started using the name Christopher Kenneth Gerhardt. He stayed in Wisconsin just long enough to attend a few classes and go through with a quickie green card wedding. According to his wife, Christopher told her a sob story about needing to get married to avoid serving in the German military. She finally got around to filing for divorce in 1992, but by then, Christopher was long gone. In fact, he disappeared the day after the wedding and landed in the posh suburb of San Marino, California a small, quiet, and close-knit community a few miles from L.A. where the streets were lined with McMansions. By now, he was using the name Christopher Montbatten Chichester, 13th Baronet. 
to help cement his status as a member of the British aristocracy, he even handed out little cards with the Chichester family crest, a heron with an eel in its beak, printed on them. In reality, the baronet was sleeping in his beat-up brown Dotson. But he wasted no time in hitting the local social circuit. He found his way to the Episcopal Church, where parishioners say he charmed the little old ladies and their teenage daughters. He told his new friends that he was a student at the University of Southern California's prestigious film school, which was a lie, and he said he had a special interest in film noir, one of the few things that turned out to be true. And his new church family provided him with a seemingly endless supply of free rooms and free meals. It seemed that Chris could talk his way into anything, even though his family never seemed to send those trust fund checks through, and sometimes random items went missing from his host homes. In another bizarre twist, for a brief period of time, he actually hosted a local public access program called Inside San Marino. It ran on Channel 3, where the faux film student interviewed guests, including former LAPD chief Daryl Gates. Chris got another lucky break when he met Ruth Dee Dee Sohas, a former socialite who'd become a reclusive alcoholic. She invited him to live rent-free in the guest house at 1920 Lorraine Road. Dee Dee would be an ideal target for a red-collar criminal. She was lonely and a long way from her debutante days. Neighbors said Dee Dee spent the bulk of her time wandering the house in a satin robe with a vodka cocktail in her hand. She was also reportedly beginning to suffer from dementia, a perfect storm of circumstances that allowed Chris to assume control. For a few months at least, the arrangement appeared to be a match made in heaven. Then Dee Dee's son, John, and his wife Linda, and several of her cats, moved into the main house with Dee Dee. According to friends and family, Dee Dee doted on her only son. She adopted him with her third husband, and after the couple divorced, she and John shared an even closer bond. On paper, John, the 27-year-old, 5'5", socially awkward computer programmer, and Linda, the 6-foot redhead, appeared to be an odd match. But they bonded over a shared love of sci-fi. John was a Star Trek fanatic. Linda was a talented graphic artist with a special passion for drawing unicorns. She worked at the Dangerous Visions bookstore in Sherman Oaks to pay the bills, and sold her art under the pen name Cody. The couple married on Halloween in 1983. According to friends, Linda and John clashed with Dee Dee, and with the guy living in the guest house. Linda's friend Sue Kaufman told the TV show American Greed, Deadly Rich, but Linda said her mom's house guest was creepy, and that she and John didn't really interact with him. It seemed obvious that Linda and John wanted to move out of Dee Dee's house, but, like a lot of young couples, they were trying to save money. Then, one Sunday in February 1985, Linda's boss, Lydia, came to the bookstore after a weekend away. She had left Linda in charge, but saw no sign that Linda had opened up the store, which was very unlike her. Linda never showed up for work again. Her boss called her family. They were getting concerned, too. The last time Linda's mother had seen her was in early February. Linda had been driving the brand-new white pickup truck she shared with John and asked her mom if she could park it in her driveway while she went on a work trip to Connecticut. Linda's mom told her no. She didn't want to deal with the hassle of moving the truck on street cleaning days. Linda left, and her mom never saw her again. Linda also told Sue that she planned to fly east with John, who she said had a top-secret job offer in New York, something involving satellites. Sue Kaufman and Linda's family also got calls from a cat hotel. Apparently, Linda had prepaid for two weeks' boarding, left her cats there, but never picked them up. Alarmed, Linda's family called the San Marino Police Department. When police came to Dee Dee's house and asked about the couple's whereabouts, the answer that she gave them was bizarre. Dee Dee claimed that the couple had been sent on a secret mission for the government. She knew this, she said, because she had a source who had set the whole thing up and who was in touch with John and Linda. Some people suggested that police talk to Christopher Chichester. San Marino police detective George Yankovich, who is now retired, told American Greed that he came to Dee Dee's house on Lorraine Road to check up on John and Linda and found Chris in the guest house. He said that Chris came to the door totally nude and was dirty, like he had been digging. He said that he noticed that the carpet had been pulled up and that there were plastic bags lying around. He said, at the time, Chris told him he was a nudist and said he thought Chris was just a little off the wall. He never imagined that such a mild-mannered, diminutive young man could be in the process of chopping up a body and burying it in the backyard. Dee Dee told police later that she had learned from her contact, Chris, that John and Linda were working for a French aerospace company. She was forwarding the contact all of their mail, which she said he was somehow sending to them by way of an address in North Carolina. Why? No one knows. And police couldn't ask Chris, because he was already gone. Chris was headed for the East Coast, driving John and Linda's white truck. And by the time he got to his destination, he would be someone completely different. Christopher Chichester left San Marino, California in spring 1985, under a cloud of suspicion following the abrupt disappearance of his landlady's son, John Sohas, and his wife Linda. By the time he arrived in Greenwich, Connecticut, he had become Christopher Crowe, film director. His new name came complete with a new backstory. He claimed that he produced the 1980s remake of Alfred Hitchcock Presents and said that Cameron Crowe, writer of Fast Times at Ridgemont High, was his brother. A check on IMDb shows that the cover story was pretty good. There was a Christopher Crowe listed in the credits for Alfred Hitchcock Presents on IMDb, just not this Christopher Crowe. But true to form, by the time people started asking questions, he had made yet another career change. Despite having zero experience, he somehow talked his way into a position as an executive at a brokerage firm and another time as a bond trader on Wall Street. But he was fired from both jobs once it became obvious that he had no idea what he was doing. After Chris left one of his jobs, his employer actually figured out that he'd given the company a fake social security number. 
one that belonged to convicted son of Sam serial killer David Berkowitz. The case went cold, but police in San Marino never gave up looking for him. Detective Yankovic entered the details for John and Linda's truck into the national system, and he got a hit. The man California police knew as Christopher Chichester, now Christopher Crow, had been living in the wealthy enclave of Greenwich, Connecticut, about a 50-minute train ride from New York City. Once again, Christopher made friends at the local Episcopal Church. It was a mix of new money, including hedge funders, trying to avoid New York state income tax, and old money families whose relatives could trace their lineage back to the Mayflower. Police discovered that Chris had been trying to sell the truck to a minister's son, but the potential buyer had abandoned the vehicle after he found out there was a lien on it. And when police from California came to New York and Connecticut, Chris somehow managed to stay one step ahead of them. A detective once asked Chris's boss at Kidder Peabody to set up a meeting, which he did, but Chris never showed up. He seemed to always have some kind of personal issue, like the time he told his boss that his parents, who he said were missionaries, were missing in Pakistan. By now, Christopher Crowe was morphing into his most ambitious identity yet, James Frederick Mills, Clark Rockefeller. According to Mark Seal's book, The Man in the Rockefeller Suit, Clark got the idea for the name when he was trying to bluff his way into a reservation at a main restaurant. He used the last name Rockefeller, and it worked, so he decided to stick with it. He moved to New York City's Upper East Side and became a regular at New York members clubs like the Algonquin and the Harvard Club. But after losing several jobs, including a job at a Japanese bond firm based at the World Trade Center, Clark needed another source of income, and it wasn't long before he found one. In 1993, he met Sandra Boss at a house party in Manhattan. The theme was the board game Clue. He was dressed as Professor Plum. She was Miss Scarlet. Sandra, who would go on to graduate from Harvard Business School, was the real thing. She was smart, successful, and would go on to earn millions of dollars a year as a high-level executive in the prestigious consulting firm McKinsey & Company. Clark thrilled her with stories of his adventures, going to Yale at age 16, heliskiing in Canada, and his job, which he said was helping third-world countries restructure debt. He told Sandra that as a child, he was mute for 10 years after the tragic death of his parents. He only regained the ability to speak after a chance encounter with a dog, and he said the first word he ever uttered was woofness. Some of his stories, like his insistence that he had a key to Rockefeller Center, did seem a little fantastical, but Sandra, like a lot of other people, chalked them up to the eccentricities of the elite. And Clark did have a huge collection of modern art in his walls, with originals from artists like Jackson Pollock and Rothko, that was worth hundreds of millions. In 1995, Sandra and Clark were married in a Quaker ceremony on Nantucket. He never had a real job, but always had complicated stories he told Sandra to cover his lack of income. Usually, they involved some kind of lawsuit against the family trust. Clark was closing in on having everything that he seemed to have ever wanted. Wealth, power, and complete control over his wife's income, which was between $1.2 million and $2 million a year. But back in California, the skeletons in Clark's closet were coming to the surface. After Dee Dee Sohas' son John and his wife Linda disappeared, friends say she fell into a deep depression. She started drinking even more heavily and spent daytime in her pajamas. She sold the Spanish-style house on Lorraine Road and moved into a trailer home in La Puente. Dee Dee died of a heart attack in 1988. A new family moved into the house on Lorraine Road, and things stayed pretty peaceful until in 1994 that construction crew unearthed the body buried in the backyard. In addition to the human skull, the forensic crew dug out other pieces of bone, including a forearm and parts of the spine, according to a police report. The body was clothed in a red flannel shirt and jeans. Detectives were sure they had found John Soas. But this was 1994, and back then, IDing a body was more complicated than it is now. The technology did not exist then to get DNA from bone. Also, John was adopted, and police were unable to find his biological parents for comparison. Police also couldn't locate dental records for John. So, once again, the case went cold, and once again, Clark Rockefeller got lucky. A few weeks later, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were murdered in Brentwood, and the O.J. Simpson case became a national obsession. The story about bones in the backyard disappeared from the headlines. Back in New York, Sandra continued to be mystified by her husband's strange behavior. He could be so charming and sweet, the way he adopted a paraplegic Gordon Setter dog who needed a wheelchair to get around, and then lovingly brushed him every day but he seemed to change after the wedding. Behind closed doors, he was becoming more controlling, alienating Sandra from friends and family and showing signs of a violent temper. Journalist Walter Kern, who wrote a book called Blood Will Out about his long friendship with Clark, said that he met the fake Rockefeller in 1998. He was actually the person who helped facilitate the dog adoption, driving the Gordon Setter, Shelby, from Minnesota to New York as a favor to Clark. The two men struck up a friendship. Clark won Kern over by telling him that he cooked four-course meals for his other Gordon Setter, that he lived above New York City's best dog acupuncturist, and that Tony Bennett lived next door. In fact, he said that Bennett's singing voice soothed his dogs through the walls of his apartment. At the time, Walter Kern said he believed that someone who was so devoted to his animals could not be a bad person. And, like so many others, he admitted that he got sucked in by the famous last name and seduced by the idea of making a member of American aristocracy his BFF. Later, he learned that the dogs, like everything else, were merely pawns to provoke an emotional response in Clark's victims. Psychopaths need a prop, he told an audience during a talk in Chicago. By the late 90s, Sandra wanted out but she decided to give her marriage one more chance when she found out, to her shock, that she was pregnant. She would later testify in court that she believed that Clark had sabotaged the condoms they were using for birth control. In 2001, 
the couple had a daughter they named Ray Starro Mills Rockefeller. Clark called her Snooks. On the surface, Sandra and Clark looked like the perfect couple, and to the outside world, he appeared to be a devoted father. He would later brag to the Boston Globe that he taught Snooks to read when she was just two years old, and said they would spend hours each day reciting Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, The Daisy. Snooks may have excelled intellectually, but her teacher said that socially, she was struggling. She could hold conversations with adults, but didn't seem to know how to play with other children. They believed she seemed overly anxious. Sandra insisted that she and Clark relocate to Boston, where Ray could be put in regular school. So the couple moved into a $2.4 million brownstone in Beacon Hill, and Clark settled into the life of a house husband. He met other stay-at-home moms at Starbucks and charmed them with stories of his daughter's brilliance. Behind the scenes, Sandra hired a private investigator to look into her husband's background, and what he discovered was shocking. He found no assets, no birth certificate, no degree from Yale, no passport. Before 1997, it was as if Clark Rockefeller had never existed at all. Sandra may have been naive in matters of the heart, but she proved herself to be a shrewd businesswoman and used her newfound knowledge to her advantage in cutting a deal for divorce. Sandra got the house in custody of Ray and would be allowed to move with her daughter to London. Clark failed to provide identification to the judge, which hurt his case. He got $800,000 and three supervised visits with Ray per year. In return, Sandra appeared to back off in quizzing him about his past. When she moved to London in 2007 with Ray, I'm sure Sandra was relieved to have Clark out of her house and her life. She probably thought that the worst was over. But the moment when a red-collar criminal begins to lose control is one of the most dangerous times for their victims. Clark had already committed fraud. He had lied to Sandra and stolen from her for years. He had money, he had his freedom, and he had access even if it was limited to his daughter. But it wasn't enough. Because in his mind, Sandra had threatened his self-image and threatened to unravel the life of lies that he had so carefully constructed. In his mind, he was the victim. He started telling anyone who would listen that Sandra had ruined his life and stolen his daughter. Sandra had uncovered Clark's fraud, and that's when red car criminals often lash out at those people closest to them, friends, co-workers, and family members. Clark was no exception. He felt like a victim. He wanted revenge. And he knew just how to get it, by kidnapping his daughter. Clark planned Ray's kidnapping with meticulous precision. He called a limo driver, someone he trusted, and asked him if he wanted to make an extra three grand. He told the driver that someone was hassling him and his daughter, and he needed to lose them. Unbeknownst to the driver, the person that they were shaking off was not a creepy stalker, but a social worker. During a court-supervised visit at a park in Boston, Clark coolly grabbed Ray, jumped in the waiting SUV, and made a dramatic escape. He headed to Baltimore, where he had already created yet another identity, as Chip Smith, boat captain. He had converted around $300,000 of his funds into gold coins and bought an old catamaran. Clark reportedly knew nothing about sailing, and the boat was a wreck. He had made contacts in Peru, so a lot of people believe he planned to sink the catamaran and fake his own death. But he never got the chance. Because, ironically for someone who craved attention his entire life, the famous last name that he created for himself backfired. The story of Ray's kidnapping was reported around the world, and as the feds closed in, people from every period in his life started crawling out of the woodwork. Many people have compared Clark to Patricia Highsmith's fictional con artist turned killer, Tom Ripley, and the talented Mr. Ripley, because everything in Clark's life was fake. He was playing roles and constantly changing character, his look, his voice, his backstory, to suit his audience. Everything was an imitation of something else. Clark was convicted in 2009 of kidnapping and assault and sentenced to four to five years in Massachusetts prison. Meanwhile, back in California, detectives were finally able to positively identify the body dug up from Dee Dee's backyard as John Soas. In 2011, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office charged Clark with John's murder. When reporters asked Clark questions about his daughter's abduction and John's murder, he bannered with them as if he was hosting a garden party. But any romantic notions of whimsical adventure ended at the trial, when forensic examiners described the condition of John Soas's body. John's body had been cut into three parts. The head was found in a plastic bag. Other pieces were stuffed into book bags from the University of Wisconsin and USC, both universities that Clark had attended. And crucially, the font on the bags helped identify them as designs that were only available during the exact years that he had been to those schools. At trial, detectives explained how they pieced together the events around the time that John disappeared. Police had identified the guest house as the primary crime scene. When they sprayed luminol in the room, a large area lit up, indicating the presence of blood. Frank Sheridan, a forensic pathologist, testified that John's cause of death was blunt force trauma. His skull suffered at least three blows, two to the forehead and one to the right side. Sheridan said that John was hit with an object with a curved surface. He said it could have been a baseball bat, a piece of wood, a hammer, or a fireplace poker. Walter Kern had another guess. He wrote that he believed the weapon was an old school phone. A Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department criminologist testified that John had been alive when the killer attacked him. Whatever the case, after the first blow, John was helpless to fight off his attacker. John had been stabbed at least six times, and his shirt had been slashed with a sharp tool, something like an ice pick or box cutter. The circumstantial evidence was stacking up. A friend testified that Chris borrowed a chainsaw from him in January 1985. Mark Seal also wrote about an acquaintance of Chris's, who testified that she came over to the guest house to play a game of Trivial Pursuit, Silver Screen Edition, that spring. That's when she noticed a rectangular patch of earth that, quote, had obviously been dug up and filled in, end quote. 
When she asked Chris about the dirt mound, according to the Pasadena Star News, he told her he was having plumbing problems. She was horrified, years later, to discover that she had basically been invited to a tea party on top of a gravesite. Then there was the couple from Chris's Bible study class who remembered that he tried to sell them an oriental rug from the guest house. They passed on the rug after noticing that it had what appeared to be a small blood stain on it and pointing the stain out to Chris. According to court documents, another neighbor remembered confronting him about the thick black smoke that was coming out of the guest house chimney. It smelled horrible, she said, acrid, like burning rubber. He apologized and said he'd been burning carpet in the fireplace. Detective Yankovic, who questioned the man he knew as Christopher Chichester all those years back, told American Greed that he now believed that he'd been in the process of cutting up the bodies when he came to the door on that fateful day. He recognized the evidence bags that contained John Soho's body as the ones that had been on the floor. Still, there was no smoking gun. He may have swindled a lot of people, but officially, Clark Rockefeller had no criminal record. And dressed in his expensive suit, tie, and spectacles, he looked like he had never done anything more physically demanding than play a game of squash in his entire life. At trial, his lawyer tried to use Clark's diminutive stature to his advantage. Could someone who stood five foot six and weighed just 140 pounds really have bludgeoned John Soas' skull and stabbed him six times? Instead, the defense suggested that Linda, who towered over John at six feet tall and 200 pounds, may have committed the murder. As for motive, the prosecutor said it was simple, money. The man Dee Dee knew was Christopher Chichester, they claimed, was getting chased by creditors. He wanted access to her estate. After John and Linda disappeared, Dee Dee cut her son out of her will. Then, at the moment when she was most lonely and vulnerable, Clark introduced her to Don and Linda Weatherby, a couple who lived in nearby La Puente. Despite the fact that she barely knew them, Don and Linda took over Dee Dee's affairs. They bought her groceries, drove her to the doctor, and, since Linda was a realtor, conveniently helped her sell her home and buy a mobile home near them. Tom Miley, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department homicide detective who investigated Linda's death, took a deep dive into Dee Dee's will. He told Mark Seal that when the Weatherby sold Dee Dee's house, they borrowed $40,000 from her. That same $40,000 loan was forgiven in Dee Dee's will. He said that the Weatherbys paid the $40,000 to Chris as a finder's fee for introducing them to Dee Dee. There's also evidence that Chris may have shown up after Dee Dee's death, possibly to ask the Weatherbys for more money. But Miley said the Weatherbys told him there was nothing left of Dee Dee's estate. Tragically, all along the way, a lot of people knew that Clark made up stories, lied, and even stole from people. But over and over, they seemed to write off his behavior as essentially harmless. This can be a fatal mistake. Red collar experts advise that a record of deceit and petty crimes in a suspect's personal life can be huge red flags that a violent confrontation is coming. At trial, Clark's lawyer used an insanity defense. He said that Clark suffered from narcissistic personality disorder and delusional disorder. At some point, he said his client told so many lies that he believed he was living in a magical, insane world. He then supposedly suffered a psychotic break and believed that his daughter was communicating with him telepathically. Clark's lawyer also grilled Sandra Boss in court. How could a woman who was so accomplished, he asked, not figure out that her husband was a con artist? She kept her cool. She said, quote, I came from a place where people didn't jaywalk. It never occurred to me that I was living with someone who's lying about such basic stuff. I'm not saying I made a good choice of husband. It's pretty obvious out of blind spot. All I'm saying is, it's possible for a person to be brilliant in some areas and stupid in others, end quote. Clark was found guilty of John's murder in 2013 and sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. He has never admitted to any role in the crime and continues to claim that he's innocent. To this day, he refuses to answer even basic questions about his life, including his name, his childhood, and his multiple aliases. After his arrest, he continued to politely deflect any questions about his childhood and his mother and brother, who were very much alive and talking to reporters, despite his lifelong insistence that he had no family. He said, quote, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to remember. I don't lose much thought over it, end quote. This case continues to fascinate me, and there are so many unanswered questions, including what happened to Clark's beloved Gordon Setter dogs? After years of being totally devoted to the dogs, he appeared to completely stop mentioning them. Walter Kern asked him what happened to Shelby and Keats. Clark told him dismissively that both were run over in freak accidents. Walter Kern said he doesn't buy that story. He thinks that Clark, like a true psychopath, simply got rid of his props when they were no longer useful. As for Clark's art collection, to the shock of many in the art world, every single piece was found to be fake. The priceless art was actually worthless. Many people in Manhattan social circles claim that some of the forgeries could be hanging on the walls of various galleries to this day. If the private collectors know, they aren't telling. What really happened to John Soas in the guest house that night? Something must have made Clark, aka Chris, panic. Maybe, as a lot of people speculated, John wanted Chris out of his mom's guest house and her life. After spending a lot of sleepless nights on this case, I have a theory about what could have happened, and it's one I've never heard mentioned anywhere else. A lot of reporters who covered the case have referenced the talented Mr. Ripley and its obvious similarities to the Rockefeller case. In the book, Tom Ripley took on the identity of people that he killed. Chris Chichester and John Soas were about the same height and build. What if Chris planned to live as John in New York, then later come back to collect his inheritance? At some point, Dee Dee reportedly complained to Don Weatherby that her son John was using credit cards in New York, but said he never called her. But we know that John was already dead by then. Could Chris have been using John's credit cards? And finally, what happened to Linda Soas? Linda's body has never been found. Prosecutors believe that Clark killed her, but no one knows for sure. 
Linda's close friend, Sue Kaufman, never gave up. She kept in touch with the police and even wrote Unsolved Mysteries a letter. She insists that her friend had every intention of coming home from her work trip and says that Linda would never have left her cats, who were like her babies, behind permanently. Linda's mom, her former boss, and her friend Sue each received another potential clue. Three postcards from Paris, all mailed on April 29, 1985, according to court documents. Lydia, her former boss, received a postcard that read, Not quite New York, but not bad. See you later, Linda and John. Sue Kaufman got one that said, Miss New York, oops, but this can be lived with. Love, Linda and John. Linda's mom's card simply read, Took a wrong turn in Europe. But according to police, Linda had no passport, and there's no record of her ever leaving the country. So if Linda did write the postcards, is it possible that Chris Kahn turned to doing it, perhaps with some kind of story about being a secret agent? Linda's mother told the court that she wasn't sure the card had come from her daughter. A handwriting expert testified that they believed Linda had written the text. Frank Gerardo Jr. wrote a book called Name Dropper, Investigating the Clark Rockefeller Mystery, and he said that the handwriting experts were split. A DNA sample from two of the postcards came from an unidentified male, but it was not a match to Clark or to John. Police later found a storage locker. Inside were postcards from all over the world. We know that Clark had a history of using postcards to mask his location. Back in college, he sent an ex-girlfriend a postcard with a UK postmark, when really he was living in California. Then there were the mysterious phone calls. Lydia said that she got two calls about Linda after she vanished. One from someone in LA who said that Linda wanted a job reference, and another person claiming that Linda was applying for a credit card. Also, a woman who claimed to be a friend of Linda's picked up her beloved cats before they were due to be destroyed. There is strong evidence that Linda was seen at least once after John disappeared. Remember the Kelms? They were the couple who met Clark when he was Christian, and they were visiting Germany. During his time in San Marino, he would stop by their house from time to time, usually to stash some boxes, and thrill them with completely made-up tales of his successes in film. He would say he was going to Cannes, or that he'd just bought a house next door to Linda Evans, star of Dynasty. After John disappeared, the Kelm's son, Wayne, saw Chris at the house. He was carrying out a box he'd been storing there. Wayne noticed that there was a strawberry blonde woman, matching Linda's description, sitting in the passenger seat. He said it appeared as if she'd been crying. Could this mystery woman have been Linda Soas? Detective Miley thinks so, and he says he doesn't think that Linda's in Paris drawing unicorns. Detective Miley thinks that Chris killed Linda and buried her somewhere much closer to home, possibly in the desert. His theory is that Chris convinced John to fly out on an earlier date than Linda, and that after they got separated, Chris killed John. At that point, Linda may have figured out that there was not going to be a spy adventure for her or John. Christopher Chichester may have left the Kelms' house with Linda Soas in the passenger seat, but by the time he got to the East Coast, he was Christopher Crow, and Linda was gone. Red Collar is an Audio Chuck original podcast. Research and writing by me, Catherine Townsend, with production assistance from Alyssa Gostola and Resonate Recordings. You can find all of our source material for this episode on our website, redcollarpodcast.com. So what do you think, Chuck? Do you approve?